Hey, tell me that two o'clock call time. All right. You ready? Call right, time. Let me see. How does that look? I don't think so. Oh, it's up to you. You only blend it with the chair, too. You know why I'm glad you're the first person on the show? Because I'm awesome. Be no, besides that, uh, it's because you'll be honest with me. Yes. Like, already, you're here. We haven't even talked about introduction yet or anything. Right. And you're, you're, you're tearing down the set already. You're telling me that we shouldn't have this plant here. <sighs> It's because I love you. Because the plant's fake for everybody out there listening. Right, but that's, I don't know. It feels like, it feels, um, I want to be real on this show and if we're going to keep everything real, I think that should include the plants. Uh-huh. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay, well, anyways, this is good because first of all, too, we're also going to be doing this at my house so anything can happen. Podcast is called Wide Open, so just get ready because people will be walking in and out. Uh, Are you looking at stuff. the camera? I'm looking at you. Oh. Thank you for being the uh, the first guest and- No problem. Another reason I wanted you to be the first guest- is Because I live here? Because you live here. Convenient? Do that too. Can I talk? Jeez. The reason I want you to be the first guest is because uh, obviously I'm more comfortable with you than anybody else in the world, but I also know that you have an amazing story, a fascinating story. It's one of those, your story is is so unique and so crazy that- First of all, I feel like the world needs to hear this story, uh, but it's one of the reasons that I fell in love with you from the beginning is because- Because I'm you know, so screwed up. Because <laughs> No, you're not screwed up. Well, what we're going to get to the story about, too. People are going to hear about, about it. Maybe I like screwed up people. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe I like screwed up people. I don't know. Uh, but before we get into that though, I, I wanted to get your opinion on all this because, um, and we've purposely, we've talked about it. I'm not going to lie, but we've talked about me doing the podcast for a long time. And you were one of the people from the beginning. You told me to do this probably three years ago. I did. I want to know why you thought I should be doing this three years ago, let alone doing it now. Um, I feel like your quest for like knowledge and this journey you've been on to kind of, you know, better yourself and better the people around you. And I feel like you're kind of like the leader in your friend group as far as, you know, discussing interesting topics about how to level up really and how to be the best version of yourself. And I thought to myself, like with your background and the people that admire you and look up to you, why, why wouldn't you want to share that on a bigger platform? Of course you should, of course you would. And of course this is where we're sitting. I mean, I, I, I envisioned all of this happening for you um, because you love it so much. This is your passion. And, um, I'm glad we're here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I was too chicken. You were, but look at you now. <laughs> look at me now. Thank yeah. you for talking me into it. Yeah. yeah. I guess before we start too, we should talk about how we met. Um, okay. And since this is my show mm -hmm. and people, you're my guest, I'm sure they'd rather hear from you. <laughs> so let's talk about how we met. How, how did, what do you remember like the first time you saw me and how did our relationship start? Well, I was um, working as a waitress in a cocktail bar. I always sing that song when I talk about how we first met. Cause it's- When I met you. Yeah. That's what people know the chorus. Yeah, it's a great Go. song. Um, and it is how we met. I was 20, 21 working at a, a restaurant or bar, whatever that place was. I mean, it was kind of this huge dichotomy of like class and elegance and chaos. And it was run by Dennis Rodman who you were friends with. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was the whole reason you came down to his his spot. I was working there and you were kind of hiding in the back. And I remember seeing you and thinking you're really handsome. And, but I thought nothing of it. And when I spoke to you, I feel like there was this ease and comfort. I think we talked about this maybe last week or so, but there's something in, you know, there's everyone's like, oh, is it love at first sight? Or do you believe in soul soulmates or whatever? And I think, for us, what we talked about was that when you meet the person you're supposed to be with, at least for us, it's not a zing. It's not like, a, oh my gosh, you're the one, or it's not this lustful, like I need to be with you and all of that. It's more of like an ease and comfort thing. It's a more of a familiarity of the other person. It's like, I know you, how do I know you? Or I feel like I've known you a hundred different lifetimes. And there was just an immediate ease and comfort. And I think we talked the first time we met for like 30 no. minutes and I was working. I was not a very good waitress, just so you guys know. <laughs> Clearly, I sat and talked with my customer for 30 minutes. Um, but um, yeah, there was just an ease and comfort to it all. And I thought you were really cool. Yeah, I thought yeah. you were pretty cool. Mm, you're pretty cool. Uh, and by the way, I did ask you out. And you did. I gave you my phone number. You said, you I asked you for your phone number and you said no. I did. Uh, but I'll take your number. And I told you. <laughs> 
I that told was my this move. woman. That was my move. I said, hey, don't take my number if you're not going to use it. Because you, it's he not going to hurt my feelings. I promise right. you, we've been sitting here talking. You seem like a really cool person. But you took it anyway. I did. And you didn't use it. I did not. You never called I me. had a boyfriend. Yeah. I was trying to be polite uh -huh. um, by taking it. You know, what uh -huh. was I going to say? Yeah, you know what? Actually, keep it. I understand that. I, <laughs> why, why, why would a... Um, I don't know. Okay, forget that. I don't even want to You're still there. upset by that? I just don't understand why you wouldn't take, you know, don't take my number. If I, I gave you an out. <laughs> I gave you an out. Why would you take the number if you weren't going to use it? I mean, maybe I, I was thinking about using it. That's good. You thought you were going to hurt my feelings. I'm thinking you're just so nice. I am so nice. <laughs> so anyways, uh, off of that, we, uh, a year went by. Yeah. Where we, nothing happened. I mean, I, yeah, I, but you obviously didn't call me and I, and I was fine. Okay. You got a boyfriend, yeah. but I would still come into the bar. I, I was hanging out with Dennis Rodman a lot back then, mm -hmm. uh, partying, going La Vida Loca back then, having a good time. Yes. When and, I met him, by the way, mm -hmm. you were wearing puka shells and like a Jamaican shirt. It was- That stuff was cool back the then. The look was not hot, but I, I saw what was inside. No. <laughs> it was cool back then. Anyways, uh, so I went to the bar all the time. I'm young. I think I'm 26 at this point, 20, 27 or something like that. Yeah. And- I'm in that stage of my life where it's it's party time. It's, it's it's let's get out there and have a good time during the off season. Yes. A year goes by. Uh, I, I leave for back to Kansas City to play. I, I'm come back out and I see you a couple times and nothing happens still, which is fine. And then I'm up in LA one night and I get a call from a buddy of ours named Doug, who yeah. was the manager of Josh Slocum's was the name of the Yeah, I was the, down the in bar. Newport Beach. And I was up in LA at a, at a Hollywood club and he calls me up and he goes, hey, Tony, I think... Uh, you know that girl, Toby? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, uh, I think she's single now. And I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. And immediately, I was with a bunch of guys. And you know the story, but I'm telling everybody else out there. I was with a bunch of people, a bunch of guys. And I look at them and I give them the signal, like, let's go, wrap it up. I'm going. And by the way, this, the bar she works at is all the way down in Orange County. And I'm up in LA, which is about an hour and 20 minute drive. Yeah. And it's probably 1130 at this point. And I was not drinking. Those that are good night. friends, by the way, to just like up and leave the club for an hour drive. They got in a car. Well, because they, I think they like Josh Locums too. Uh, they were looking for girls. A lot of hot girls there. It was girls. Right. There. And so anyways, we get in the car and I, we drive the hour and 20 minutes. I get down there and you were leaving because I guess it was a slow night. Mm -hmm. And I saw you in the parking lot and, and I played it off and I was like, Hey, what's going <laughs> on? I didn't. How no have you way. been? <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. And they all went into the uh, the club and I, me and you, we sat out there and we talked for yeah. about an hour. And like we always did. Like we always did. And then I asked you out and I would say the rest is history, but it's not. And we won't get into too, too much detail because I don't want to bore everybody, but a little bit went by where, where we would date off and on. Yeah, it was very casual dating scenario off and on. For, kind of for about three years, right? Yeah. For about three years. So that whole love at first sight, going back to what you were saying, it, mm -mm. it wasn't us. That certainly wasn't us. I'm not saying it doesn't no. exist, but it wasn't like, oh, deep love. And then what really did it for me is we went out on the date and I never knew that you sang before. I mean, I knew that you sang, but I never heard you it sing. It never like come up. Yeah, it never come up. Yeah, and you're then, like, oh, you sing. That's nice. Because you're, and we'll get into the story in a little bit, but- I remember we went out karaoke or we're at a bar and we're out there having some drinks with one of your friends named Pook. Um, her name's Stephanie. Her name's Stephanie. We called her Pook. <laughs> so you and Pookie was, um, we're out. It was just us three. Yeah. And you got up and you sang the song. Uh, what song did you sing? Let's hear it for the boy. Let's hear it for the boy. Yeah. And I remember looking at you going, wow. That's it was like cool. a slow motion, like Wayne's world thing, like dream weaver. Everything slowed down. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that was it. I think after that, I was smitten. I was like, wow, this I would is, have never known that. Be the girl. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that was, you didn't it, tell me that till later on. I was like, really? That was the moment. It was kind of cool. You had, <laughs> you're beautiful. You're nice. And then you have uh, this amazing ability to sing. It's cool. Talent is cool. Thanks. Don't you think, don't you think talent is attractive? It's definitely added value. Yeah. You think so? You can catch a football. It's nice. I like that. That attracted you, yeah. right? Yeah. And then that was it. Then she came to visit me. Then what? Go ahead. Tell the story. I feel like I'm talking too much. No. And then I, we dated off and on and we dated one summer pretty strong, solidly for, I think about three months. And then um, I was finishing up school and you're like, come out to Kansas city. Um, I don't know. Come for like 10 days. So 
I packed my bags. I finished school. I went out for 10 days. I was super excited. And it was the first time we were together on like an extended stay situation. Um, and I think the 10 days were almost about up and you looked at me, we were walking down the street or something and you were like, I really don't want you to go. And I was like, I know, I really don't want to go. And then you were quiet for a second. You looked over at me, you're like, then don't. I never left. I stayed in Kansas City, shipped all my stuff there. I mean, if that ain't love, I don't know what is. California girl, leave it <laughs> to go to Kansas City. I must have, it cool, must have been love. Yeah, but the Midwest is cool. You enjoyed Kansas City, didn't you? I really did enjoy Kansas City. It was a struggle. I didn't know what an ice scraper was. I froze. I didn't leave the house after like, I don't know what month it started getting cold. Yeah. It was pretty ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. tell me you got used to it. But it was fun. Girl. All right, good. So now people know how we met. Yes. And then after that, pretty much the rest is history. Literally, we got engaged that summer, bought a house, got married. Got married. And got then pregnant. Got, got pregnant right away. <laughs> Boom. Because we're not playing around. No. Okay, we know what we want. Maybe. We're going after it. <laughs> uh, so, so, okay. Now, I want to talk about how you grew up. And this is okay. probably how most of these podcasts are going to go. Okay. Uh, I want to, because I'm really interested. I, I, I do believe a lot of, not, I, it's not even about what I believe now. The science is, is there to say that how you grow up and the influences you have when you're a child, the experiences that you have shape you for the rest of your life. Okay. It makes you who you are Yeah. and it can either make you better or it can make you worse, you know, depending on the circumstance and you, your story, the reason I find it so intriguing is because you went through a lot, mm -hmm. you went through an incredible amount and your, your story is fascinating. It's got the glitz, the glam, the heartbreak, the love. Uh, and I was just blown away that you could be this person coming from a place like that. Because let's be honest. I mean, a lot of people might look at you from the outside and go, oh, there's a pretty girl. She's, she's married to a football player. Uh, she's probably this type of person, but yeah. it's not that way. And I think that's why a lot of people uh, are, are attracted to you because of your warmth, your kindness. And I think it all, it all comes from how you grew up. So mm -hmm. having said that, I would love for you to walk everybody, give the details of, of, of how you grew up, of where you came from. Well, thank you for saying all that. That's so nice. I don't hear that kind of stuff from you very often. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up, it was chaotic. I, I had a parents who were kind of rock stars. My dad was really famous in the seventies and I didn't really grow up with him. Um, as you know, and uh, my mom was a singer and, you know, she, they were all friends with Stevie Nicks and I grew up going to her house and they were playing music. I used to fall asleep on these gigantic amplifiers where everybody was like rocking out and they'd stuff toilet paper in my ears or cotton. And I just grew up in just kind of like music and wild, you know, kids who grew up in the 60s and 70s. They were just hard partiers. Um, my whole life. And my mom kind of got caught up really young and, um, you know, kind of escalated to heroin eventually. And so most of my childhood was spent kind of mothering my mother, mothering my sisters, um, having to grow up really fast and not really having a childhood. We didn't, I mean, we didn't have electricity for like a week. We had no food. Um, it was just everything you could ever imagine it being when you grow up with, you know, parents who are addicts and, who don't have the time or energy to take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your, your father, he had a famous song. Yeah, my I mean, dad, who I have a great relationship with now, as you know, and really because of you, you've like encouraged me to, you know, like get close with your family, you know, you gotta forgive and all of that. And uh, my dad was really busy and famous in the seventies. Um, he had a, a, a song called Come and Get Your Love, which is now on Guardians of the Galaxy. and all these different commercials mm. and it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's the song that goes, uh, Hey, Hey, what's the matter with you? It's like the old seventies roller skate. Well, of course, classic. come and get your love. Yes. Right? It's playing every time we're in a restaurant where I was like, Oh, there's dad. Oh, there, there's mm -hmm. grandpa. Or, oh, he's playing again. But, um, yeah, I mean, he left for tour, um, and left my mom with two kids to take care of. And my mom was like, this is not what I signed up for. So I'm out of here. She married my stepdad who um, was good to us in a lot of ways, but had his own demons and his own addictions. And, you know, they were constantly fighting and there was a lot of domestic violence and all of that. So it was just constant moving, constant evictions. We were moved around with all different family members. So there was literally no stability at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And right no. now you have how many siblings? 
I have my full sister, which is Sarah from my mother, a half sister named Noelle from my mother and my stepfather. And I have a brother and sister from my biological father and my stepmom. Okay. So I want to get into this because this is when I first heard the story and it's still a little confusing. <laughs> I, I couldn't Blew explain your it now. mind. Yeah. Because yeah. how is everybody related throughout this whole Well, you know, thing. it's free love and all of that kind of thing. Um, so <laughs> my parents, my stepdad and my mother, I was about 10 years old, maybe, no, I was younger actually, it was like kindergarten, um, had this babysitter move in with us named Acela. And I love Acela, Acela's like the bomb. She's the most fun, most loving person ever. She lived with my stepdad, my mom and I, and my three sisters, my two sisters. Um, and she just took care of us and she was around. And all of a sudden one day after a year or so, she left. I didn't know where she was. I had not seen my biological father in probably like four years. I, last time I saw him, I was like two and you know, I was older then. And I finally go to my mom. I said, you know what? I really want to like see my dad or like meet him really. Cause I haven't seen him since I was like a toddler. And she said, okay, all right, fine. And it just so happens she knows exactly where he is and exactly where to find him. And my stepdad has no clue about this. He would like kill her if he ever knew that they still talked. So I go to see my dad. And I walk into the um, condo they're living in. And my mom goes, oh, by the way, you have a little brother. And I'm like, I do? She's like, yeah. She's like, you're going to be surprised. And I walk in and I, I, I look at my dad. I see my dad and there's a familiarity you have with a biological parent that just happens. And you're just like, oh, there's my dad. And I just walked up to him, ran to him, hugged him. I look over to see his wife and my little brother. And his wife is Asela, this babysitter that like mm -hmm. lived with us for the last like year. And I was like, Asala, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, my brother. Oh my gosh, my dad, Asala, my little <laughs> brother. It was like all happening in my mind, like at rapid speed. And I was like, this is amazing. This is great. My mom was like, hey, what's up? And clearly my mother had introduced Asala to my father, my biological father. And they got together, had my brother, my little sister, Frankie, um, and seemed really great. And they're still best friends. Um, but fast forward, my mother passes away of an overdose eventually after yeah. all the chaos in between um, when I was about 15. Um, and my sister, I went to live with an aunt. My well, two sisters and I got split up. Right. So, so yeah. I, I want to, because I want to get back to the- The long, to, the, to, I want to get back to the death story. of your mother. Yeah. Because uh, I think that's, that's obviously a big part of growing up for you. Yeah. Uh, probably the most- impactful moment of your life. One of the most yeah. impactful moments of your life. But before we get there, I want to continue about the family. So you got a little brother and a little sister now yeah. with the babysitter, Acela or slash best friend. My mom's best friend. Mom's yeah. best friend. Uh, and then what happens after that? Cause you have. Well, I have to, that's why I was talking about how my mom passed away. Okay. Because after my mother had passed away, Acela and my dad had gotten divorced. And then Acela and my stepdad got married and had a kid. So I have like a step step sister. So okay. Estella married my bio biological father. And then after they got divorced, she married my stepfather. Married your stepfather. <laughs> and in the meantime, your yeah. youngest sister yeah. is the daughter of your stepfather. And my stepmother. And your stepmother. Mm -hmm. And so everybody there basically see, I, it's still confusing. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Thanksgiving gets real weird. Yeah, when I first met all these people, I was sitting at the table and I'm like, okay, so who does, <laughs> who's this person right Right, here? right, right. That's, that's your sister We're just all from related. them. And, yeah. and so anyways, this whole love triangle or not even a, a rectangle, yeah, love but rectangle. Everyone assumes that my mom would be like <laughs> so upset by this. My mom would be so on board with all this. She probably would have been like, oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, totally. Uh -huh. You two should totally be together. My mom was very like 70s flower child, like go with the flow, like would have wanted everybody to be together. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So, so we could talk about the, the, the death of your, of your mother and mm -hmm. how that impacted you growing up? Um, you know, most would assume that that was like the worst, most horrific thing that anyone could go through. And of course it is, of course it's shocking and it's devastating. And you go through all of those emotions of, you know, what is, what is it going to be like for me when I have a wedding and when I have kids and all those kinds of things. But for me and the way my life had gone up into that point, um, I saw what my life would have looked like if my mother had stayed alive mm -hmm. and it would have been hardship and it would have been struggle and it would have been more instability and more chaos. So when she passed away, I was surprised to find myself like relieved by it all. Really? And in, in, in 
I didn't feel guilty about it either because in a way, like it was the only, it was a gift she gave me to pass away. I mean, like I, it truly was because my life would have never slowed down. My life would have never stopped being chaotic. My life and my sister's lives would have just been constant hardship and pain and trying to help my mom, even as an adult, how to navigate all of that. You know, I see, I see people now mm -hmm. that are so, trying to deal with that as adults and it's terrible. It is. So, so at the time though, did you know that? And what did you tell yourself at that time while that was happening? I felt relieved. I mean, I was sad. I cried. I didn't went through all the emotions, but then I was, yeah, I was definitely relieved. And I think I just told myself like, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it was like, all right, well, I'm here. I know I'm not going anywhere and I'm going to take advantage of this, of the position that I'm in, which was a really great position. I was living with an aunt who was very well off. I was living in a very affluent area in Orange County and going to school with a bunch of like really smart, great people. Um, so I just immersed myself in every social activity. I did all the things that I'd ever wanted to do growing up. And I got to like be my age. I got to be a kid essentially for the very first time without having to worry about when the ball was going to drop. And that was big for me. I mean, I would go ahead and say, and I think most people wouldn't say this, that high school was one of the best times of my life. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for high sure. I enjoyed high school. You enjoyed junior high, high. Well, you were we like, stand. junior high was the worst. You were like all American football player. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Of course you enjoyed high school. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyways, I think, um, I think junior high is one of the worst Ugh. times yeah. for a lot of people's terrible, <laughs> at least for me, I had a bully. In junior high, I got shipped off to Florida to live with an aunt and uncle who yeah. was a pastor. And that was like the most transformative time of your life. You know, seventh, eighth grade, it's like your hormones are like raging and you don't know what to do with yourself. And they were like, oh, so nice to meet you. And uh, you won't be able to wear makeup, wear your hair down, watch television. We're going to go to church three times a week. I mean, it was like culture shock, but truly the best thing that ever happened to me at that particular moment. Like, you know, the universe works in like crazy ways. God works in mysterious ways. You know, it's so interesting that at that particular moment of my life, that transformative time, I get shipped off to live with, you know, an aunt and uncle who are like, oh no, stop me in my tracks. And we're like, uh -huh. you won't be doing any of the things you thought you were going to be doing, <laughs> which God only knows what I would, I probably would have ended up like pregnant or on drugs or something if I, hadn't gone there. I mean, who knows? Uh -huh. And then off of that too, you said it was one of the worst things that ever happened when they told you that they, yeah. they can't keep you. Right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, we were living there for two years and I got really attached to them. I found like a, 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 a love and a connection with them and I loved it. And I, it was like a family unit. And even though we didn't have a lot of money and we were living with their daughters and it was, you know, it was hard. We didn't, have much, but, um, they had said like, we love you. We want to, we want you to stay forever. And this is going to be great. And one summer I went out to visit my mother. She was in another rehab facility and, and, you know, a mess of course. And they called right before I was supposed to come back. And it was the year I was supposed to start high school. And they were like, we can't have you guys back. And there was no explanation. So to say I was like heartbroken was, I mean, really heartbroken. Mm -hmm. Like everything I thought my life was going to be had once again been like, nope. Boom. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell me this because I think, you know, I love, this is like all the stuff that I'm about. Yeah. Okay. How does somebody get to where they are uh, mentally, physically, spiritually? And I'm looking at you. I would say you're a success story. Thanks. But, Cause I'm not crazy. Cause you're not crazy. <laughs> honestly, a, a lot of people would go through that type yeah. of situation and they would give up. Uh, they would, start hanging out with the wrong crowd. Yeah. I, I know your friends. I know your friends from, from your, from when you were a child, yeah. they're all good people. Good you people. didn't get attracted to the wrong crowd. And you know, I'm not throwing your family underneath the bus uh, by any means, but some of them have made different decisions than you. Like your, your sister, Sarah, who we love, uh, she got pregnant in, yeah. in high school. Right. Uh, and your younger sister, Noel, and we'll get to this later that is, is the, the mother of our adopted child who got into the foster care system and, and got hooked on drugs, got hooked on meth. That's, what, that's, her, that's her drug that she's well, on right now. Yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, among other things. Yeah. Uh, so how were you able to, 
to end up how you did versus, versus then where did that strength come from? Where did that perseverance, do you have an explanation on why you were able to get through all that? You know, we talk about this a lot. Like, are we born with this grit and this strength? Are we just born who we are? Or is it by the examples that I, I saw um, at, as opposed to the examples that my siblings saw, or was it me like absorbing all the good and kind of leaving the bad and they absorbed it differently? I really don't have an answer for that. I mm -hmm. don't know. And I don't would, I would never want to take credit. Like I've just, I'm just smarter. I'm just got my shit together more. I don't know. Um, none of that's true. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but for some reason, I, I mean, I prayed a lot. I had a lot of faith. I saw, what I wanted, I saw, and I, I, I call it crazy, but I would just, I would see my life in like such a magnificent way. Like I wanted everything. I and mean, I was, it, it was kind of superficial in a way, but I wanted to uh -huh. like, I wanted a big house. I wanted a nice car. I wanted the nice clothes. I mean, I had to wash my socks in the sink and I was just living in a very poverty stricken way my, most of my life. But for whatever reason, I made friends with all the rich girls at school in like kindergarten and third grade. And I mean, I beelined for those girls that were like getting the straight A's and had the cute clothes and, you know, had the sta stable families and I would post up at their house and I would make myself real at home and <laughs> just be like, now this, this is where I belong. It was very like, uh -huh. this is what's, this is how my life is going to go. And do you think that, 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 I think that's kind of a technique there. It's something hmm. that was just innate in you though. Yeah, it was just me. But is there something to be said in your opinion about you are who you surround yourself with? Absolutely. And this is what successful people do, right? Absolutely. I would say that my friends have been my biggest influences. Mm -hmm. People that I've picked out personally to be my family are the ones that have really truly been there for me. Um, you know, aside from a few of my, bio, like my family, my blood family, but like the people that I've picked out are just truly the people that I want to emulate and I want to be like, and they inspire me. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so your, your, your mother passes away, you finish high school, you go off and you start your singing career. Yeah. Right? Cause you wanted, you wanted to pursue singing yeah. at first before you started working at the, um, at Josh Locum's mm -hmm. at Dennis's yeah. spot. Uh, you had a professional contract, right? For I singing did. and all that stuff. Yeah. How did, how did that transpire? And why did you move away from that? Mm. Well, I was going to college and I was going to a very small Christian college. It was very religious in my youthful um, days. Which um, might be something to say too about yeah. coping with all that chaos and madness. Yeah. You grasp onto spirituality. We'll call it spirituality. Yeah. I, 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 I went I to know church. it's a certain religion, but it was I loved just it. spirituality. Yeah. I mean, I would say that the church kind of saved me because it was like a safe haven for mm -hmm. me to go to meet people, um, friends. I would go on trips with the church. It was a really cool kind of non-denominational laid back church. Um, not, not a lot of restrictions, not the way I had lived previously with the, my um, family in Florida. So mm -hmm. it was very like relaxed and cool and loving and welcoming. And I definitely found like refuge in that space. And mm -hmm. it, it truly did save me and keep me on the right track. I mean, I didn't have parents to raise me, but I had been looking for a guide, guidance. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was the church, it was God, it was the faith that mm -hmm. I found. And I allowed that to parent me mm -hmm. in a way. So, so you go to, so you go to college. Yeah, I go to college. And Sorry, you, I got off track. No, no worries. Yeah. And you, so you go to college and you start singing. Yep. I got uh, a scholarship so you were going to college, for singing. Going for classes and stuff like that. And then yep. you would sing uh, for the school. And then you would, how did you get into the professional content? A lot of this stuff, I don't even know. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't know the details of it. I was it. singing in college. I mean, I was like the biggest choir geek ever. And, um, but I kind of wanted a little bit more and I was living out in LA and I'd met some people and, I got a couple different production contracts and I had written some music and sold it. And, um, and I'll tell you what, like if you don't have anybody looking out for you in Hollywood, it is a very scary place for a single young girl. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, they will chew you up and spit you out faster than you can like, uh -huh. you know, I mean, it's just wild. So I found myself in these weird predicaments where I was working with these gentlemen and I actually shouldn't be using the word gentlemen, but um, these men. It. These dirtbags, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. Not all of them are dirtbags, but there's just a couple scenarios that would come up and it was like, I always ended up being the their date instead of they're like, oh, we got to go out to network. We got to go meet these people. We got to do these things. Next thing you know, it's like, I start a conversation up with another person. They're like, why are you talking to that guy? What are you doing over there? You should be over here. Almost like being mm. treated like a little bit of a- pos- the, the little bait and switch now. Yeah. Hey, come on out. I'm going to introduce you around a little yeah. bit, get your career going. But hey, you're with me now. You're with me and yeah. I and you're my date and I'm, you know- it's rude if you go and talk to another uh-huh. another male or, you know, you don't stay by my side kind of situation. I found myself in a predicament where I had been flown to New York, first class, went to go audition for LA Reed and do all of these really cool things. And um, I get to New York and I found out that, you know, this, this gentleman's only gotten one hotel room. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, I thought we could just, you know, stay together in this, this hotel room. And I was like, that'll be a no. Uh-huh. That's not going down. Like you better give me my own hotel room or I'm out of here. Yeah. And all this is going to How do you, how do you over. make that decision when knowing because you hear you hear rumors. Now I don't know yeah. if these rumors are true, but you hear rumors about women, men doing whatever it takes, quote unquote. Well, there were to, there were there were to the top. How do you stay away from something like that? How do you say cuz I'm I, I got to believe too, like you said they weren't dirtbags. That was my word. Maybe yeah. they're nice guys. Maybe they're good-looking nice guys. It's hard you know not to be a someone. hoe when you have a, you know, a carrot dangling in front of your face, like a record contract or a or a, all of the I mean, it wasn't hard for me not to be a hoe, but guess what? I see now that when you have, you know, a person who has the ability to literally like make you a superstar, you're a dime a dozen to them. And if you ain't gonna do what they want you to do, then guess what? Somebody else will and they're right behind you. So to me, it was just, it, it wasn't in in me to be that person. It wasn't in me to, you know, have a relationship or, you know, be intimate with somebody just because I wanted something from them. Um, but I saw a lot of that, a uh-huh. lot of that. Uh-huh. And, yeah. uh, but I, I, I admire, obviously, you're my wife now. So I admire yeah. that strength. For you to say, you know what, I'm not going to do it. It's not worth no. being famous and, and having money. Yeah. I would rather opt out of this. And so right. what happened? Did, how did you opt out of that? I just got tired of it. I got tired of kind of just being pulled and, and treated like, you know, kind of like a piece of meat a little bit. And it just was a dirty business. And I would go ahead and say, like, I've done other things like hosting and acting and all of these things. But music is by far the the grimiest of the grime when it comes to the people that you have to deal with sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know why that is. That's weird. I don't know. You know, it's a lot of late hours, a lot of studios, a lot of like, and it's gotten better. And thank God for like the the me too movement. I mean, I think a lot of people are scared. So that's a plus. I think now that people are more aware of the fact that they aren't going to get away with a lot of that bullshit is, is a good thing Mm -hmm. for sure. Right. Okay. So, so I think that's bringing us back to where I come into yeah. the, the story a little bit, right? This yeah. is probably around 21 and you got a, you still got a boyfriend too. So I, I want to start getting into relationships. Yeah. Okay. Before we get to our marriage, yeah. you had a relationship, a five-year relationship yeah. with, with, with a guy. I did. Who, who I know the stories. So he wasn't a good dude at all. Yeah. I mean, it didn't, it didn't sound that way. I think I, innately, I do believe that everybody has some good in them and for yes. whatever reason, they go astray because of how their life has turned out. Yeah, what they had been through. And so with this guy though, he was, he what, what, what's up with him? Um, you know, he was charismatic and wonderful and he had a career um, in baseball when I met him and he was really amazing in the beginning. And then it just, it started to turn a little bit possessive and controlling and um, a little violent at times. Uh-huh. And I found violent myself meaning, meaning, meaning what? Meaning that it got, you know, I, it got violent. He was violent with me a, okay. few, a couple of times. Not, not, it wasn't a regular thing, but doesn't need to be. It's one, in, you know, it only takes one time. But, um, I found myself kind of emulating the relationship that I saw my mother have with my stepfather. Okay. And it, and it stopped me in my tracks really. But by that time I was so in love and I was so committed to making it work and helping him out. And, you know, I was that saving type of girl that, you know, I can't stand now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm always like, oh God, please don't give me daughters that are those kinds of girls that are looking for like the wounded bird. I, I was that person. Uh-huh. Um, 
but it taught me so much. I mean, what did it teach you? It taught me that you do, you do, and you should fight for what you want. And I loved, loved him. It was the first like love of my life, you know? Um, and I fought for it, but at the end of the day, you cannot change someone. It taught uh-huh. me that no matter what you do, no matter how much you love somebody, no matter how much you know, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna change anyone. Uh-huh. People are who they are and they have to want to change. And everyone says that and it's so cliche, but it's true. You, you cannot and you will not change someone. Mm-hmm. They have to change themselves. Uh-huh. And so that relationship ends. Yeah. Uh, any- it, also, it also taught me like, I will never put up with any of this crap again. Like I had drawn the line in my mind, like I have a certain way that I expect to be treated and I will never be treated like I had in my past relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it it really empowered me and gave me strength once I got to the other side of it. Yeah. I always like how you say uh, every, you think everybody has to go through that shitty relationship before you get to the good stuff. Right. I always tell people that I'm always like, yeah. And and I know, I know it. I mean, my little nephew is 18, just broke up with his girlfriend. He called me all heartbroken. I was like, and you got so mad at me because I was like, that's great. You know what? That's a good thing. This is what yeah, everybody's got to go through. Cheated on her. <laughs> and this, you go, you're just, I'm oh, such okay. a dude. I know. Oh, well, I'm you know what? Bad. You'll get over it. It's okay. Love you, honey. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like uh, console this kid. You're like, right. tell him it was a little insensitive, but it was because <laughs> I wanted to be like, yes, this is part of it. Like, this is all part of like the human experience. Mm-hmm. Like me being with my ex-boyfriend was part of my story and I wouldn't be who I am if I hadn't been with him. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he feels the same way about me. Like it, 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 good or bad or whatever it is, it teaches you something about yourself and it mm-hmm. creates the person that you're supposed to be, even yeah. if it's like terrible. Have you ever, were you heartbroken? Yeah, not, not the last time I broke up with him, but like throughout the relationship on a daily, but on a regular. Heartbroken. Yes, devastated. Um, See, I believe that having your heart break in a loving relationship, mm-hmm. that's kind of a rite of passage. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't yeah. you agree to that? That, that? That's kind of, everybody has to go through that at yes. least once. Because that's a human experience. It's a human experience. And so you like with your, I think that's where it was last night with your yeah. nephew. You were saying like, look, it's okay. Everybody has to go through this. Everyone has it's to go It's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, then you're kind of missing out on the human experience. Do you think, you know what, you need to go out and get your heart with, with, we have four children. Yeah. Do you think, are you, is that some advice you would give to your children? Hey, you got to go get your heart broken. I mean, I wouldn't say go get your heart broken. I would say <laughs> go, you know, go fall in love because I would go ahead and go out on a limb here, but I would go ahead and say that they're not, the first person they fall in love with isn't going to be the person that they're going to spend their life God, with. I hope not. God, I so hope not. that, um, that being said is there's heartbreak in that. Yeah but it's part of the experience. Like go learn about who you are and who you want to be and who you want to be with, who you want to spend your time with. Um, Yeah, I'd say just go live life. Fall in love if you want to fall in love, travel if you want to travel, go on dates if you want to go on a date. Yeah, we're married now and we are, we got, just talk about our, our marriage ceremony. Okay, I hated that you called it that. You made, it just stirred the pot. Yeah. So back when I was younger, uh, I I like to research stuff and looking at marriage, let's just be honest about what marriage is. Yeah. Okay. A joke. No. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm talking about the act of getting married with a piece of paper legally binding. Yeah. And it served a purpose in its day. It served a purpose. You know, back when I'm not going to go into the details, but back when marriage started, I'm sure people might leave comments about this, but from what I understand, the research I've done on it, it was done to obtain land and it was right. arranged marriages. And so uh, fathers wouldn't leave their children. Whatever yeah. it is. So I was looking at statistically the success rate of a marriage. Uh, it scared me. You know, it was like- As it should. It's, it's over half, half of them end in divorce. It's something like 58% and 72% yeah. of them are unhappy. And then how many people don't report that they're unhappy? So I was thinking, okay, I got about a 10 to 15% chance of of being happily married. Yeah. What's that comedian that's like, if you have a parachute and you're about to jump out of the plane and the guy goes, Hey, you have a 15% chance that that thing opens. Are you still going to jump? 
No. That's there marriage, right? Like, I, I think it's Bill Burr, who's one of Bill my Burr, favorite yeah. comedians out there. <laughs> and he's like, like, are you still gonna, you're still going to jump? Hell no. I remember I'm playing football at the time and one of his jokes too, he's like, hey, is this the line to give away half my shit? <laughs> like right. It's like, why I would I it. do this? So I had this idea of marriage um, as I was in love with you and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you, but it was still scary yeah. as hell because I was like, well, what if it doesn't work? What if it's, it's four or five years later? So we decided- uh, I had proposed this to you and you accepted it. But can I just tell you that we were filming the show called Hard Knocks. And when we were filming that, we were in the planning of our commitment ceremony. And because you said the words commitment ceremony, it became like a laughing, like ongoing joke with your teammates. And it pissed me off so yeah, badly. It should have too. It was so, so ridiculous and so unnecessary, but you were like firm on calling it a commitment ceremony. So a commitment ceremony, which I <laughs> believe, first of all, it's a marriage. We had a wedding. Right. We, I, I spent just as much money so as I was ever going to spend it on a wedding. wedding. You didn't need to say it's not a marriage. I so should have called it a wedding just so ceremony. people out on right. the outside knew. Left you alone. Left me alone yeah. and wouldn't mock it. Right. Uh, but I thought it was beautiful. One of our good friends, Tony Richardson, who I played with uh, in the Kansas City Chiefs, who's a very spiritual guy. Uh, he was back then and, and he conducted a beautiful ceremony for us. All yeah. our parents were there. We walked down the aisle. We did everything as a normal wedding would be, but we didn't sign the piece of paper. Yeah. And the reason I didn't want to sign a piece of paper is because it was one of those things, Goldie Hahn and Kurt Russell, uh, I think they were somewhat, in, they inspired me with this where it was, hey, we're together because we want to be, not because we have to be. Mm -hmm. We don't need a piece of paper to say that we love each other and we're committed. We live together. We have children. We do everything. Yeah. And I was, I was inspired by that. I'm like, why couldn't we do that? And so that's what we did. Um, but what did I say to you when you asked me if I was okay with that? What did you say? I said, I'm cool. I just want a ring and a wedding. Sure. And a commitment. I want you to get up in front of everybody and say, I'm committed to you. I mean, you wanted to have kids, really. And that was the only reason I wanted all of this to go down. You wanted kids immediately. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I need you to give me a wedding, a ring, and a commitment. Done. Done. So having said all that, I want to know, what does it mean for you? What, uh, like a, a marriage, a relationship, uh, what, what does that mean to you? And what are the qualities to keep that going strong? Um, I think... A marriage and a committed relationship, I think it means, you know, keeping each other accountable, um, inspiring each other, encouraging one another, um, sticking by one another through, you know, hard times and calling each other out when you're acting like jerks. Um, and it means the world to me. I think the key to having a healthy relationship is is being able to be truly, I mean, you know, you don't like the word brutally, but brutally honest with somebody mm -hmm. and being able to take brutal honesty from the other person and know it comes from pl a place of love. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like that word. Brutal. I know. Cause I don't think you have to be brutal. I'm pretty brutal. Honestly, but. you can be uh, lovingly honest and, and still accomplish the same yeah, thing. Sometimes you, you need, I don't know if the lovingly honest is as uh -huh. effective sometimes. Okay. So you're saying sometimes yeah. you got to just go out there. And it's like the too. F word. You can say something without the F word, you know, but it's not going to have the same effect if you don't use the F word. Like sometimes uh -huh. the F word is just necessary. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, by the way, I think people yeah. out there should know that we are in fact married now legally. Right. Because the- <laughs> You're so negative. What? Marriage is not that bad. I love it. Marriage. <laughs> I love being married. I really, really do. I know, do. but it's just funny that you uh, still are like. Mar marriage is the hardest thing. Yeah. One of the hardest things that you'll ever do. And then you combine that, and we'll get to this in a bit, but you combine that with having kids. Yeah. I mean, first of all, kids <sighs> it's rough. is the reason you get divorced. <laughs> really? A lot of people are going to like to hear that, but the stress, and I'm not talking about the children. Yeah. I'm t they, they have nothing to do with this. I'm talking about the stress that comes along with being a present parent, to being somebody who's there and the, the frustrations that that, that brings from a financial standpoint, from an emotional yeah. standpoint, uh, God forbid stuff goes wrong too, which, you know, it, it's just tough on a relationship. But marriage, uh, I love it. And we, we are legally married now because my financial advisor calls me up one day. <laughs> thanks, thanks, financial advisor. Shout out to the financial advisor. <laughs> no, no, well, don't act like you didn't care. I'm just kidding. I don't, uh, I don't care. But financially, 
there's a thing called the death tax. Yeah, they kind of force you to get married. They force you to get yeah. married. It's kind of messed up. Legally. I'm talking about the legal version of it. And yeah, the death you, tax. What is it, like 10% of all of your- No, it's more than that. More than that. It, yeah, it's more than that. If you die, I don't know what the rules are now, but back then the he was like, yeah, if you passed away, God forbid, uh, this yeah. is how much money goes to Uncle Sam and taxed instead of- Damn, Uncle Sam. Instead of your family getting it, which right. is who you've been- you know, it's what you've been going over the middle, catching all those footballs for is to, to make sure that they're set up and this, they're not going to get that. This yeah. It's kind of, it's amount. real. So we went down archaic. and we just signed some papers. We didn't have a, a, a ceremony about it. We just went down there legally. It was the beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe you. Um, so having that, then we started having children and you know what? God forbid they see this. What do you mean? Just Did the I way you said that. Then we started having children. You know what I love about marriage hmm. is because stuff like that. I just said, I didn't mean anything by that either. I was just saying, it would just we started natural. having children, but you in your head are going. I want you guys to rewind that and look at the way he said that. No, I, and you I'm, tell me if you went children, <laughs> you guys tell me. I meant children. Like in a way we started having children. Like we started getting okay, that's after better. That sounds like we much started better. playing the game and, okay. and the hitting got big. You know, they were going over the, you know, does that mean uh, football analogies? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand it? Fine. Okay. So my whole life is football analogies and I never know what's going on. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. So anyways, <laughs> um, seriously? There's Chica. <laughs> Hi, Chica. Okay. Uh, okay, go on. Go on. Get out of here, Chica. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we are shooting this are home. at home with our dog. Yeah. It's coming in there. Chica. Um. For the people out there, I'm sure they want to know what type of dog that is or this thing. It's a She's a golden doodle. Golden doodle. Perfect. And she is an attack dog, just so you guys know. Yeah, she will bite your ass if you try to get in. No, <laughs> she is. She's crazy. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so, so marriage, I want to talk, uh, talk about the, the trials and tribulations of marriage and then adding children on top of that. What's your thoughts about that? Uh, it's a shit show. <laughs> is that it? Would you That's like to it. expand? Nope. No, just kidding. It's, no, it's, it's beautiful. I always say having kids is the hardest, most loveliest, craziest thing you'll ever do. Mm -hmm. And it's the most rewarding of all the things that you'll ever do. I mean, your responsibility is to put out good human beings. How, why, what? Nobody knows how to do this or mm -hmm. get it right. And there's no potion or, or, or scientific mathematical equation that's going to give you the antidote to create a good human. So all of us are out here like blind, bleeding the blind to try and create these good human beings. Yeah. And you could take someone else's recipe and doesn't work. You could have five kids, four of them end up great. One of them ends up like an idiot. Why? We don't know. We don't know. But you know what it is? It's the human experience. Each one of us has our journey. And if you accept the fact that you know, your kid's journey isn't based on whether or not you spanked them or not, or put them in the corner or whatever way you want to parent your kid isn't going to, you know, help you figure out or give you the answer about why they ended up, you know, on drugs or, or a jerk or whatever it is. What's your best advice on parenting? If you um, can give me some takeaways here, right. that's what the show I want it to be all about is people listening. I want them to hear background story, but then I want them to have some takeaways. Give me, give me some takeaways of, or tools that you use in order to be a better parent. Um, I have recently been trying to detach myself from my children's accomplishments. Um, I think there's a lot of parents that I know that, you know, whatever their kids do, it's almost like whether they win a football game or get up and sing at a talent show or dance recital, whatever it is, when their kids succeed, it's almost like they're succeeding. It's like, mm. oh my, the elation. Of course you're happy for your kid, but I also want to be detached from that. And I, I don't want to get my happiness from their happiness. I want to be happy because of my own life and because of things I have going on. And I'm going to be happy for my kids. But if I live in that space of constantly being attached to their happiness, that means when they're not happy, I'm going to also be attached to that. Mm. And I don't want to be attached to any of that for the rest of their life. I want to be able to let go of whatever happens to them, whatever decisions they make is just part of their life. It's not who I am and part of me and my experience. Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, uh, what, same question yeah. for, for marriage. Somebody who is going through a rough patch in their, because uh, everybody has them. 
everybody, if you get married, you are going to go through a rough patch. What do you mean? Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. Not us. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. <laughs> yeah, we just went through a big rough patch. <laughs> we did. Uh, and there's there's different peaks yeah. and, there, and there's valleys and there's ups and there's downs. Uh, what would you, what advice would you give to somebody who's going through a, a, a valley right now? I would say, I mean, it kind of goes back, at least for me, I, I have to, especially for women, I would say, and for men too, but I had to learn to stop taking things so personal because a lot of times when you're hurt by the other person, it has nothing to do with you. And that's kind of where I had to go. I had to really kind of stand in knowing who I am and what I want and what I stand for. And if your partner is going through something and you're feeling like insecure about it, or, you know, like it might be you that they're feeling like the reason they're feeling the way they are, you have to remember who you are and remember what you bring to the relationship and remember what your morals and values are and your, you know, what your worth is because you can be, you can get in your head a lot. And I would say, so just don't take things so personal, let things roll off your back and um, find the humor in, in the, in the chaos, in the fight. Mm -hmm. in the fight, you got to find the funny. Yeah. That's find tough the, to do. Find right. the funny in the fight. Otherwise it's going to be a long life. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you'll do, right? We're arguing sometime. Yeah. We'll, we'll do little, like how you just said, it's a long leave back. Oh, are you really upset? Is that what's going <laughs> on right now? And you make these little faces while in the middle of a heated fight. I know. Uh, and then we'll start laughing about it. Right. But still pissed off. Yes. Don't take that you away. Are. Still upset. Right. But, there's because by the way, there. just so you guys know, a little on a little personal note, every time Tony and I fight, his his best comeback and his standard comeback is always, well, what about you? Look at you. What about you? Yeah. And I'm always like, genius. Way that's to that's a good one. I was just way to tell you, that's stick a good one. it to me. <laughs> you got me. What about me? Yeah, <laughs> I'm always I don't know like, what else to say. I'm yeah. always like, oh, here that's we go. A filler comment. And, and it like, makes okay. me laugh actually. So it's keep doing it. Oh, okay. It works. Oh, good. I'll keep it up. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, so when it comes to relationships, what do what does the woman want? Uh, what what like, advice question. would you give to all the men out there? Cause I got to believe probably that majority men are going to be listening to this. What, uh, what is it that you would want more from me? Uh, and what do you think women want more from a man? Um, sex. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Every man out there is going, yes. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right. Um, some women. Yeah, of course. Um, um, so what, what, what do I think women want? Um, but what advice, I mean, you could say, you know what, this is pretty simple, guys. If you could just do this, you would alleviate half of your problems with, with your, yeah. in your relationship. I mean, I'll say what I want, what I would love and what we're constantly working on. And I would say the thing that keeps coming up in our relationship that I complain about the most would be communication. I think most men lack the ability or the want really to communicate very tough, you know, for you guys to like explain something or, or give us details or, or give us a heads up. It's always like, oh yeah, by the way, and you're like, what, what do you mean? We're leaving on vacation in three days and I have to pack four kids. Like what? So there's things that, you know, we just need a heads up on. I think communication is key. I think also, um, you know what your love language is. For me, it's um, affection and gifts. You know, know <laughs> who you. you are. Lucky you. That's the only thing that makes you feel. The only thing that makes me feel good is getting you know, <laughs> affection and gifts. <laughs> I mean, yeah. know yourself. I and, and you're so you know you're good about that. You so give you're me saying what I need. To the men the out there, figure out what makes your woman, your tick. wife, or your yeah, woman. Yeah, like what is her love language? Tick. Is it is it um, compliments? Is it um, acts of service? Most women I know like acts of service. Acts of service, take, meaning like take the trash out? I need out? you to take the damn trash out. Okay. Okay. I need, you know, women like you to like take initiative with the kids. Like, hey, don't worry. I got the kids dressed this morning. I got breakfast handled. Oh, hey, I know you had to work late. Don't worry. I ordered dinner. I handled it. There is, there is like, a, 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 like a, your loins just go up in flames for women. I mean, they get like so turned on when they see their husband doing dishes. It is like a thing. I'm not kidding. Like when the acts of service. What are you talking about right I'm now? I'm not playing. This is like, this is a conversation they get I have. Women get turned on when they see their yes. man yes. wash dishes. You heard me right. Yep. Do those okay. dishes. You better do those dishes. <laughs> Every man out there listening tonight is like, honey, I want to do I the dishes. I would love to do the dishes yeah. for you. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I think any sort of act of service is, is a yeah. turn on. Access, it's really an act of service. Yes. It's acts of like saying, hey, uh, let me take I this off your plate. And I want to help you. Yes. And I want to alleviate some yes. stuff from you. Okay. Yeah. So there's many love languages. And I would say a mixture of all of them are nice to mm -hmm. have, but I, you know, there's certain things that stick out more. Huh? So, yeah. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. You got a lot of guys are going to be washing dishes. <laughs> Wash those dishes. Take uh, out that trash. <laughs> take out the trash. Wash the dishes. What do you enjoy? What, what's the best part about being married? <sighs> to me, um, is just the day to day, the little moments The there's no like big aha. This is what I love about marriage. Marriage is so great. It's really just the day to day, um, little moments, like getting up and seeing you make breakfast for the kids, sitting on the couch and watching TV, um, going and, you know, watching one of the kids play a sport. It's, the day-to-day -day that builds up over time that is so incredibly precious. And when somebody, you know, we know somebody that just lost their husband not too long ago. It's the day-to-day -day that you miss with the person that you love. It's not, you know, the big moments, the big ahas. Like it, it, it really is just the love and the day-to-day -day and the monotony and the beautiful monotony. It, it really is so beautiful. The day-to-day -day little moments, mm -hmm. they all add up to like some, magnificent like thing yeah to me yeah i agree with you yeah that's what it's all about yeah i mean that's that's the stuff that you got to find the enjoyment in yeah uh because it always comes down to the little things yeah. it's the little things it in fact i'm in everything else in life that you experience whether it's business whether it's sports whether it's it doesn't matter what it is it really comes down to the little things the little tweaks yeah uh, i mean the, when you played football you it wasn't about like the playoff game it was about being in the locker room with all those guys, creating those relationships, yeah. being able to like, you know, form those bonds. It's all of those little moments that add up. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, over time. Uh, that's when just stuff you look back, I look at uh, with our four kids we have, by the way, uh, how does, being a stepmom too. Yeah. How has that been? Um, because I have a child who is 18 years old uh, from a previous relationship. Yeah. Uh, we have a great relationship too. The uh, his mother and and I, all of us do. We, we all co-parent really, really well together. Uh, but being a stepmom too, just thrown into that role, how has that been? I have, I mean, in the beginning when I first met you, you having a kid was definitely a little scary to hear for me because it was intimidating. I was definitely not in the position to be a parent or be, you know, in that kind of situation. But as I got to know you and as I got to know you know, your son, my stepson, um, it was, it, it just, it doesn't work that way. It, 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 it's, it was seamless. I have always enjoyed him. And I took the approach of, of knowing that he had a mother to mother him. And so mothering him wasn't part of my, my job with him. It was more being a support system, being his friend, being someone that he could count on and, um, was going to be there for him and, you know, give him the advice or be there to listen to the stuff he couldn't tell you guys, but he could tell me because I was more of a, you know, in the middle type person. So I've relished in it. I've loved that kid since the day I met him and I continue to love him. I'll love him forever. And he's mine too. I'll take a little credit. Mm. Yeah, you should. <laughs> should. Uh, we have, uh, we have, well, I have the 18 year old, which is your stepson, obviously. Uh, and then we have two children between us. We also have an adopted child. Uh, how did that come about? Obviously, I know the answer, but yeah, everybody out there needs to know. Yeah. Um, and why? And why was it was it important for you to adopt a child? I think you and I. Well, I was always wanting to be open to adopting. I think I had mentioned that even like in the beginning of our relationship that I wanted to adopt. I think it was mostly on my heart because. Um, of the way I was raised. I mean, if I hadn't had people take me in and, and help raise me, I, I mean, I would have gone into the foster care system. So I think it's important to pay it forward. And for me, I mean, I don't know where I'd be if people didn't have the heart to take a kid in. Um, so for me, it was always going to be part of my story. I just didn't know how it was going to look. And I definitely wasn't ready when it came to my door and knocked and was like, here you go. Um, but yeah, my sister, she's been through a lot. She's had five kids, given up all for adoption. And, you know, she's been through a lot in her life. And there's, n 
I would say that she has every excuse to be who she is today because she's been through hell and back and back again and over and over times a million. Um, but with that being said, it's painful to watch your sibling go through all of that. And, you know, I got the opportunity to live with my aunt and my little baby sister went to go live in foster care and she's where she is and I'm where I am. And I don't know what that means or why I can't explain any of it. But um, when she had her last baby, she wanted to take that baby home and try and raise that baby. And she couldn't do that. So she called us and we were supposed to take her, as you know, for a couple of days, ended up being a week and we gave her back. And then we went and got her and she was really sick and she wasn't doing very well. And we said, this isn't going to work. You need to, you need to let us, you know, hold on to her for a while until you can figure your life out. And we've had her for four years now. Yeah. So, Oh, it's been tough. Too. Yeah. And she's been tough. She's been challenging and lovely all at once. And God, life would have been too easy without her. And I think about how challenging, but like beautiful it's all been. Yeah. I mean, so hard. Cause she has her, yeah. she has her, her issues because, you know, of, you know, my sister's pregnancy and, you know, the way she treated her body during pregnancy and all of that. And, um, that baby came out with her dukes up, like ready to fight. Mm -hmm. And we've spent the last four years trying to help her understand, like, she doesn't have to fight anymore. Like, we love you. You're safe. But her, you know, epigenetics, whatever you want to call it is like, is still fighting to, to survive. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. And, and I don't regret a day of it. And I think if you never do anything good again in your life, I mean, trying to change the trajectory of another human being's life for the better is one of the best things you could ever do Yeah, and give back to the world. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. And she's everything. And to me, you know, I always wanted to save my little sister. I always wanted to go and rescue her out of that foster care system. And I was only a teenager, but in a way, because I couldn't do that. This is like, you know, when I hold Sophia, when I kiss her at night, it's almost like I'm getting the opportunity to do that for my sister by taking care of her baby. So it means a lot to me. And in this, and in this day and age with electronics, we have kids, our, our nine-year-old River, if just a Fortnite fanatic. Attic. And safe to say, yeah, safe to say. And I'm not unlike a lot of kids. I mean, <laughs> th this is the normal story. All my friends out there, they yeah. all say the same thing. My kid loves video games, loves video yeah. games. And then you got the iPads, electronics and all that stuff. What is your advice to the parents out there getting these kids off of these, these devices? Mm. Uh, and as they get older too, cause they're not even there yet. We, we have decided that we're going to really delay that giving of a smartphone oh, to yeah. our children. Um, because I kind of see what it's done to yeah. our oldest child, who's a great kid, by the way, but it's been tough because of the social media. Yeah. What is your advice uh, to the parents out there? And what is your plan to deal? My plan? You mean our plan? Our plan. Well, make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. What, what is the <laughs> plan for for our children going forward? Um, I, I personally think that everybody's making a little bit too big of a deal about this whole thing. Really? Yeah. Really? I think everybody needs to calm right down. Okay. They're like, oh, how many seconds per day does your kid use the iPad? Oh, really? You let them use it at dinner? Oh, there's so much judgment around everything. It's like, shut up. Uh -huh. It's like, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. I'm on a plane, my kid's screaming. Guess what? Judgy Judgerson over there looking at me, giving my kid an iPad. Do you want sleep on this airplane? I do. So let my kids watch this iPad and be quiet and stop judging me. Yeah, take it easy, relax. Right. Keep going now. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think, I think moderation is key on all levels for everything. I think there's a time and a place. I think that they're absolutely a godsend sometimes. And they're also my worst nightmare at other times. And I think every parent should listen to their gut and instincts and try not to overdo it. And don't become, don't let it become a crutch, obviously. And you just break it out every single second. You don't want to deal with your kid. Um, but moderation is key. Go with your gut, trust it, believe it. And don't be judgy of moms who... Mm -hmm need that moment sometimes. And what about social media? Um, so I have a whole trick and a whole view on this. I think social media is gonna like, I think the pendulum is totally swinging the other way. And I know this because of my 18 year old stepson, but he's like, I don't wanna put all the information out there. Like I'd like to be more, I don't want people knowing what party I'm at or what I'm doing or what I'm eating. He's like, you guys are all nerds, which by the way, I totally agree with. And it's totally working to our advantage. So my way, and I, hopefully my kids won't see this because they'll know my trick. My whole trick is this. 
I'm going to be so into social media, like so into it and so overboard on it that they're going to be like disgusted by it. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to be like, oh my God, let's take a selfie. Oh my God, let's post this. Yeah, let's get on your Snapchat. What, what? And they're going to be like, this thing is lame. My mom is so into this. I'm out. Like, I don't want anything to do with it. What do you think? <laughs> I don't like that plan. <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> This is where we you don't like my plan? This is where we disagree. This is a genius plan. I am thoughtfully disagreeing with you. Oh my God. This so is so genius. I can't believe you're you disagreeing wanna, with me. What are you saying? Oh, you're I'm gonna be so into social media. You don't even know what's about to happen. It's gonna blow up. You're gonna what do you I don't even know Not what that yet, means. Yes, but when the kids get older, <laughs> I'm gonna you're like, gonna show them a bunch whatever of, it is they're doing that I don't like, I'm gonna do but like times a million. And okay. then they'll be like so turned off by it. It won't be cool anymore because I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Ah, okay. So Give me an example of that. What's, uh, I mean, like with Instagram, if they're like, want to post Instagram, they're like taking, if, if my kid takes like a bikini shot, guess what? You're going to take 10 oh, bikini shots. Oh, I'm going to be like this, like, mm, like I loved your bikini shot. Will you take one of me? I, I want to do that. I love it. I'm going to take a hundred of those bikini shots and then I'm going to tag all your friends. Right. I, I, okay. I won't go that far, but you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I, I mean? I wish people could see my face right now. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand what the you know what I hell mean? you're talking about. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to go overboard with it. I'm going to be so into it. I'm like, oh my God, we should post. We should be doing this. Let's take a shot. I'll be like, oh my gosh, she looks so good right now. Let's take a picture. She'll be like, yeah, okay. yeah, I, I get what you're love. saying. Okay. So, right. you, but you're, you're, you're trying to be funny with it too, right? Oh yeah, but I'm going to be dead serious. But okay. What if they go, what if that happens? And then they're, they're like, oh, mom's doing, this is great. I want to go even more. And, and, it, and it backfires on you. What are you going to do then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought uh, that maybe, far Maybe ahead, that'll be where I come in. Okay. I have a feeling that my kids won't want to do the thing that I think is so cool. Well, the reason I'm, I, I'm asking that question, because I think social media, it, it, the studies are there now to show that it messes with, with kids' happiness. I agree. Because of, you know, if Hence someone's- my tactic to get them off of it. Yeah. Yeah, it may but not I, be your I, mean, tactic. I hope that would work. Your I, tactic is going to be, so this is why I'm taking this approach because you're so logical and you're so like, the statistics say that kids who are getting bullied, blah, 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 do this well in school and they feel this way and depression and all that. Like you're going to have all that handled. So I'll let you do all that stat, like statistics, you know, math, all those things. Then I'm going to go- Full throttle on selfies, on like food pics, on all of it. So we'll have like both of those angles working for us at the same time. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like tag team. Yeah, it's just giving me so so much anxiety. This conversation right now. You're it's, not liking my approach. I it's it's a, a I, I try to be wide open, and uh, I think you should be wide open <laughs> to my approach. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to. As people know, being wide open is not easy. Not. No, it's a tough. It's tough, but. We'll try that out, I, I guess. We'll see. Uh, or we could just say- We'll see you know, whose or, way works. Or we could just say what I'm thinking here is you don't get a phone until you're 16 years old. And we're going to bring experts on this show to come talk about this subject because this is something that needs to be addressed, I believe. Yeah, I believe in like giving kids freedom too. And like if, if they know that you believe that they will be responsible, there's also like freedom in that. And there's also them putting the pressure on themselves to be better. Mm -hmm. So if you just like, put down the rules and like, you're not getting a cell phone until you're 15 years old and blah, blah, blah. It's almost like when they finally do, it's going to be like, ooh, ooh, like going like to town with it. Okay. You want to moderate. Works, I think that maybe it can work opposite. I think it's like, okay, we're preparing your mind that the, first of all, this whole thing is not real. Okay. It's a highlight reel and that yeah, that's, the people are on there and it's going to hurt your feelings a little bit too. Totally. People okay. are going to talk So you're going to see things you. on there. Some might, somebody might talk badly about you. You're going to see your best friend at a party that, you're not invited that to. you didn't get invited to or something like that. I mean, you have to be, I believe, you have to be mentally ready for something like this. And a lot of these children aren't. I especially personally think at there age should 12, be, 13, 14. Right. You're, you're just not ready for that. I don't care what type of child. So you don't you, have. you think there should be a course in school that prepares you about how to deal with social media in this day and age? There should be a course taught in school just my opinion that helps kids navigate social media and how to act on social media, how to absorb social media, yeah. what it is actually um, and how not to bully and what the bullying does to kids and statistics on that. I mean, I think it would be so beneficial. Yeah, I agree with you, but at the same time, there's not. And so in the meantime, we need the 
parents out there yeah. to, to, to help the children out. Because that's really what it is. You're just helping your child out there have a better experience uh, and prepare them. I'm not saying you'd be blind to yeah, it. Yeah, it's the parents job right now. Out. But unfortunately, parents aren't doing that great of a job since we're dealing with all of this, you know, bullying and cyber, you know, craziness. Yeah. You know, when, when you're going through, through trying times, uh, you know where I like to go. You know, I like to go to, uh, we have a infrared sauna. And that's where I do. Oh, like, I thought you were going to say the toilet. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I go to the infrared sauna okay. and I like to sit in there and sweat and it's quiet and I get to do some deep thinking. Uh, and I find that it gives me a lot of answers. Where do you go to do deep thinking when you need answers? Oh, it's a no brainer. I'm in the car mm -hmm. for sure. I like laugh. I cry. I talk to myself. Really? I, listen, I listen to music. Mostly through music is where most of my therapy comes from. I know you hate that. You hate it when I put on like a real good sad song and like get you going. You don't like that feeling. I love that feeling. Like if I can get a good cry in, it's like the clouds have lifted. I am living. I'm uh -huh. ready to start the day. You do crying in your car? Oh yeah. Really? I cry all the time in my car. <laughs> I... <laughs> that sounds so pathetic, but no, I do. Not all the time, but like if I need to, yeah. Uh -huh. So you do, that's where you get your, your, mm -hmm. your thought process going. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I, you know, we'll talk to friends or get advice all in the car. Sing really loud. Yeah. All of it. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about traveling because something that we're passionate about yeah. is we love to travel because I think that's in our opinion, and you can add to this. I think when you travel, you open not only your own mind, seeing how other people live, uh, seeing how other communities operate yeah. and seeing history, especially if you're going to places that have old traditions, whether you're going to Europe or you're going to South America, uh, to, to me, traveling has been one of the biggest growth spurts for me. Yeah. Every time I get back, we just got back from a three week trip yeah. and that's, that was our shorter one. That's also the key to marriage though. Can we say that? I mean, it is, it is getting away and I don't care if you go on a staycation, but if you get out of your day-to-day -day routine and get away from all of the hustle and bustle of your life and you go with your family and you reconnect, to me, it's what, it's the glue that mm -hmm. keeps your relationship together is taking time away from the day-to-day. -day. And really just you and your husband, like you and I, I mean, for you and I, it was everything to be on this trip alone for a week and then have the kids come. I mean, we have like the, you know, blessing to be able to do that, but it really is important to take time out with the, with your, mm -hmm. you know, So staycations partner. are good too. I mean, I grew up as a kid. We didn't have that much money right. at all. And right. My father did an outstanding job of taking us around America. Just like, okay, we're going to go to Joshua Tree. I live in California, yeah. which is a two hour drive. Yeah. And we'd camp out with in the KOA uh, campgrounds. Sounds luxurious. Which, luxurious. Oh, it sucked at times. It's, <laughs> it's one of those things when you get older, you're like, okay, that was cool. I'm glad that I did that. But staying right. in a, in a torture, tent, uh, as a child wasn't, wasn't great. But we, you we know, should we do that again. Money. You'd love that. Yeah. Right. Just uh -uh. kidding. <laughs> Let's do it. Torture. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm going to do the dishes though. I'm not doing that. I appreciate that. <laughs> More importantly. Uh, so traveling, I think is good. Yeah. Uh, and it's good for the kids too. Don't yeah. you think? I think traveling is the, I mean, we homeschool our kids but I think being able to see the world and appreciate different cultures and, ex and it teaches your kids how to accept everyone for who they are and for their differences. And, you know, putting your kids around other kids who don't speak English and are trying to, and it just, I mean, I feel like it just helps their brain fire on different levels than it mm -hmm. would if you just kept them in the same monotonous environment um, day to day. So to me, travel is everything. And, and if you can't travel to Europe per se, getting out of your normal is so important. Ah, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. Well, uh, I want to ask you a couple of few bonus, uh, questions. bonus questions, just quick questions. These are these, <laughs> actually, this is stuff that I want to know. What's a lesson you've learned over the last year? It could be a month ago, two weeks ago, it could be six yeah. months ago. What is the biggest lesson you learned over the last year? To let go probably of any idea of what I think is going to happen or what should happen. Um, I think for a long time I was, I've lived my whole life waiting for the ball to drop. 
um, because that's how I was raised. I didn't know what was going on half the time. I was always, you know, waiting for something bad to happen because something always did happen. And I think now that I'm married and I have kids and I don't have a lot to worry about. And, you know, I have the, the blessing of being able to like be financially stable and not be in a chaotic relationship and have so much stability. It was really hard for me to kind of like lean into that and accept that everything's good. And what skill or lesson are you working on now that you would like to learn? You haven't quite mastered it yet. It could be anything. I it would could be, say- It doesn't have to be an emotional, spiritual thing. It right. Could be, I would say for me, it's, it's to be more tactful and kind with my words. I'm a pretty like, I have this thing with truth and honesty that if I don't speak the truth in the very moment that something I feel like is being fake or dishonest, that it's gonna like explode inside me and I'm gonna die. Mm. Um, so I need to learn that it's okay to speak my truth, but I, it doesn't need to come out like hot fire sometimes. Cause sometimes it does. It's like, I gotta say this and it's offensive. Mm. I need to like, I, know. I need to, <laughs> I need to I mean, rail I it back <laughs> and I need to go, okay, I can say my truth, but how can I say this in a way that really is gonna be kinder and it's gonna also help the person accept it better and, and uh, you know, retain the information I'm saying instead of getting defensive or going, oh, I don't, what did you just say? Like what? And them getting defensive. Whereas if I came to them in a different approach, they could absorb it and take it in and go, wow, maybe you're right. Or maybe I should consider that. See, that was a deep uh, skill that you want to learn. Is there like a superficial skill that you wish you had? Mm -hmm. Superficial skill or whatever, just something like anything. Yeah, something silly. I would like. I would love to be able to have a photographic memory. Photographic. So, so superpower. That's a superpower you would want. Yeah. Don't say flying. Everybody's like, I want to fly. I mean, look. Want to be if I had the ability to memorize, yeah. you know, math equations or history or information, like I do a '90s R&B, I'd be a fucking genius. Yeah. But I don't. Yeah. So I guess I'm just stuck being. You. So one thing, you, uh, I didn't, you're an expert on 90s R&B? Yes. Okay. Yes. Who sang the song, I Want to Sex You Up? That would be Color Me Bad. Oh, you're good at that. Yeah. Okay, good. Anything else? No, uh, okay. I don't want to play that game. That was a quiz. Uh, I love this game. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your last dying meal? Last dying meal. I really like this question. Yeah. And I'll probably, people out there for listeners, I'm going to ask probably all my guests this question. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big, you know, I'm a big fan food. of food. I, I, know. I am a groupie. By the way, he orders like three entrees for himself everywhere we go because he says he'd like to try things. He wants to try a little bit of everything. And if I order something different or no, if I order something the same as you, you get very upset at me. It's a pet peeve of mine. I don't like anybody at the table. When we go out to dinner, I feel like everybody at the table should order something different. And then we all try and sample each other's That's food. That's so selfish. Uh, seriously, what's your last dying meal? So I, I'm always torn with this question because you and I talk about this a lot with like different groups of people. Um, but I feel like it would be like a really good Italian, like a really good pizza, like really good pizza, you know, mm. like the oven brick pizza and I would eat it all. And you eat it all? All. Yeah, you wouldn't share it. I wouldn't either. share because no. I'm not a sharer. <laughs> it sounds food. like it. I know this. No. You get very upset when I ask yeah. you to, hey, why don't we get- My pizza. Yeah. yeah. Or I would have like a bacon Western cheeseburger, but like gourmet, like the one from Carl's Jr., but like leveled up. Like uh -huh. you got the burger, you got the two all beef patty spe patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese. That's McDonald's. Bacon. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. But bacon, you got an onion ring with barbecue sauce. Uh -huh. The patties aren't too big. They're just like perfectly like thin and beautiful. And you got a brioche bun that like is soft in the middle, but crispy on the outside. Oh yeah. Talk dirty is your to mouth me. watering. Yeah, that's, that's so great. Good. That is great. Good one. Eating healthy. You eat pretty healthy though. That would be Not as healthy as explosion. you do. Huh? Not as healthy as you do. I believe you. Whenever we order or go out to restaurants, the waiter always gives me your order. Like this girl definitely did not order this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, no, no, no. That was me for the pasta, the bolognese. And you're like, I'll have the garden salad with a side of fish. Yeah. Nice. I eat more like the man in this relationship. You do. That's yeah. true. That's true. I, I mean, I've lost so much weight. Uh, it's, you look good. Uh, I don't like eating a lot of food. I want to eat nutritiously. I want to feel good. Uh, but I do like to splurge every and once in a while. And you want to try everything. And I want to try as much stuff as I can. 
This guy. It's good. Isn't that a metaphor for life? That's why I yeah. said earlier. Right? Excessive. Like, what? You're excessive. Excessive. Yeah. Am I easy to live with? Yeah. For the most yeah. part. Good. You're just, you know, you're annoying like the rest of them. Yeah. Well, We're all annoying. I'm annoying. You're annoying. Everybody here is annoying to someone. <laughs> you're annoying. Hate not, to break it not to the you. listeners. Okay. Apologize to the listeners. You guys are all annoying to someone. <laughs> just so you guys know. All right. So what are you up to right now? What's going on in, in your world? I know you got a podcast. Uh, well, tell the people where they I can just got it. back from vacation with my kids. Um, married to a really great guy. Wait, what do you we, mean? What am I up to? You're my husband. You know my day to day. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your, your podcast. Oh, why don't you just cut straight to the chase? Yes. Well, tell people about your podcast. I love your podcast, by Thank the way. You. It's, it's called Keep On. It is. And it is really, really good. You do it with Kelsey, a good friend of ours. Yes. Uh, and I'm and I'm talking too much for you. Go ahead. No, it's amazing. I'm, I have a podcast with my good friend, Kelsey Durkin, and she is the polar opposite of me. And we disagree on a lot of things, but we have the commonality of trying to be evolved by also talking a lot of shit. So it's this great um, just conversation that we have um, on our podcast. And we talk about homeschooling. We talk about the meaning of friendship and what girlfriends mean and what it means to have them. Um, we talk about... Uh, um, you know, different things going on in the media. We talk, we discuss everything and we're always trying to get to like an evolved state of mind or a evolved way of being, but we're both very cynical. Um, so there's a lot of funny, cynical discussion and we are not afraid to cut each other down just at the knees, um, but from a place of love, but we take each other's criticism like, you know, so well. I feel like there's very rare relationships that can, really like gut you. And then you can also like, thank you for saying that. I, I benefited from that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a good time and it's an easy listen. And you really just feel like you're sitting with two girlfriends at, you know, dinner, having wine, hanging out. All right. Last question. Mm -hmm. What are you wide open to this week? This week? Um, I really want to be able to be open to getting back into routine. I think it's so important. We've been traveling a lot and yeah. I think there's beauty in the monotony and um, I love that. And I, 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 I want to be open to like being with the kids and being a unit and getting a routine down. And I don't know. I feel like our lives are always so chaotic, yours and mine. We're always going, but I feel like I really want to be more open to creating a routine this week. Just yeah. settling down, relaxing. Settling down. I'm with you there. Yeah. I'm with you there. Okay, well, good. You know what? I have uh, enjoyed talking to you. I have too. Congratulations this is, on this. This is I'm great. Very excited for I, you. I'm excited for this too. I think uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, whether it works or not, we're going to have a good time with it. Oh, it's, it's going to work. Just so, you watch and see. Thank you for being the first uh, participant on Aww. Wide Open. Um, I love you. I love you too. Good job. What do you we'll just go three, two, no, one. I'm, I'm like Tom Burgundy right now. I'm like, I don't want to use my hands. Maybe try to remember. No, it wasn't. It was Ricky Bobby. I'll count down. Do do? Three, two, one, and then you hit it. And then I'm going to okay. take the pose. Okay, okay. Ready? Three, two, one, hit it. There it is. There it is. There, cheerleader.